Um, can you identify any gaps related to the pathways of IEPs? Um, one of the gaps, and uh, uh, this certainly is not my perspective, but perspectives of, um, of, of people I've talked to, and especially my team, um, is that it's, we feel that it's really important for um, uh, IEPs to get info before they come to Canada so that they, uh, they're not uh, disillusioned. Uh, they are also, um, they don't get off, we've heard stories of uh, IEPs getting off the plane and then, and then the first thing they do, they go to an employer and say, I want a job, I'm an, an engineer. And we know that that is not the case. So we want to make sure that the IEPs don't get any false promises, uh, that they have an orientation before they come to Canada, and uh, somehow get a reality check before they before they immigrate. It occurred to me this morning when uh, Jean Augustine said that uh, processes need to be faster and fairer, that um, one of the things we did with the bridging education uh, at U of T was uh, we offered a pilot in Egypt, and um, it was uh, roughly 16 to 20, uh, probably closer to 24 weeks. But we actually uh, sent instructors out there. Uh, we had a critical mass of um, people, and uh, we ran the program there, uh, so that that would streamline the process while they and they could still be employed in their country of origin. Yeah, several gaps in addition to what the program has said, and one of them is collaboration between the self profiles, the educational institutions, different stakeholders, and that's where we are sitting here. So you can actually prefer clients and exchange information in terms where they can fit in terms of yeah, Also, I, I wanted to speak for the engineer. So I think I'm an engineer and I came here and again, I didn't make a, in, an informed decision. I didn't know anything about the engineering field, about the license process, about the labor marketing engineering. So I was lucky and it was a lot of work and I had transferable skills, so uh, I'm, um, I'm happy here. But this is another information international trained engineers should uh, access before coming to Canada. And also, I, I would like to talk about communication skills and soft skills and workplace Canadian, workplace Canadian culture. These are very important. So maybe a very good assessment tool should be applied to, I'm talking for international trained professional and engineers yes. in particular, because we know our, all our, we are technical people, so maybe communication skills. In terms of what do each of your bridging programs or what do you do to sort of encourage or sort of uh, make aware some of the ITs about what other alternate professions they can enter into based on the skills and experiences that they've been able to garner from their native country as engineers? I think, I think flexibility is a key issue and I think it's one that all the international training professionals, no matter which field they are, when they come to Canada they have to adapt it. And that's a different way. But in terms of specifically engineers, yes, they are adapting. In terms of what we do and what we provide, we provide options. And one of the options is, is skill separate. Let's say that you are a mechanical engineer with AutoCAD experience back home, but you are using 2D. And here maybe we are using 3D, for example. Then we say, okay, yes, you are a mechanical engineer. Yes, you can get a job, but you need to upgrade your skill set. And that's the key. I think when it comes to flexibility, yes, they are more flexible and you will see engineers who are actually downgrading their skill set and becoming technicians and technologists. We have seen that a lot. And I think there are so many engineers who will verify for that information in a different way. Um, and what we do there, the curriculum is structured in such a way that they get core courses so that you have all three of them taking core courses and they learn from each other. And then they branch off into what is very specific to mechanical, specific to electrical, specific to civil. And what we're finding is that there's this cross-pollination. And, and over the course of, uh, uh, of, uh, of weeks, they now realize that, you know, I am an electrical, but I need to kind of expand and, 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 and see new, uh, new challenges. Each of you, obviously, you, you run your own bridging programs. You see a number of successful students or students in general go through your bridging programs. Can you tell us, you know, what differentiates the successful students who've been able to find employment versus those who've struggled? What are some of the the, the characteristics of, of sort of you know successful students what, that they possess? To be successful in the workplace, you need to be empowered mm -hmm. and uh, enculturated. So if you don't know the rules of the game of your workplace, uh, it's going to be very hard to be successful. 
And so uh, that's really what we um, you know, try to do. And that's been a side effect of the bridging program. Originally, we thought that, okay, communication skills, um, therapeutics, uh, technical skills that people need for the workplace. But the side effect of going through the bridging was that people were very empowered. And if I can use a quick example, there was a, a young woman um, that was in the bridging program. I was at a conference in the ladies' room, and she goes, Chris, Chris, do you remember me? And I said, yeah, but I, you know, remind me of your name. She said, she, we talked, and she said, you know, I've got this problem. I've got three job offers, one in Ottawa, two in Toronto, da 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 And I said, what a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> now, she was empowered by the, by the program. because Number one, she was at a conference where she was networking and doing continuing education. Right. And she had three job offers. And what was going to be the best for her and her family? And that really, really touched me. That you all have, we all have the skills. You all have the skills. We all have the skills. You have to be proactive. You have to take ownership of your job search. You have to take advantage of all the programs and resources available. And I know I wouldn't sleep before midnight, and I was looking for jobs and for opportunities and trying to. I didn't have a network, but I was trying to take advantage of everybody I knew to get information, not a job, because. I know nobody can hand you a job, but to get information and get to get the experience, Canadian experience. So, sorry, but I was... <laughs> no, that's good. Obviously, speaking from personal circumstances, is there yeah. anything else you wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah, uh, who's Twittering here? Who's on yeah, Twitter? Up there. Yeah. It's up there, but there's some people twittering. And uh, those of you who are twittering, uh, just uh, twitter these uh, three words, emotional, social, intelligence, because that is the key. You have the skills. Now it's, it's EQ before IQ. Right? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a very good point. Um, we were talking about what are some of the opportunities for, for being able to find employment. And you know, you've talked about certain some of the skills that you, you obviously need to be able to network and to volunteer and to obviously be able to make that determination that you really want to be able to find employment here in the Toronto area. I'm going to make a, a shameless plug for one of the programs that uh, my organization is affiliated with. I'm, I don't know if uh, Roland had a chance to mention, but my name obviously is Charles. I'm working with the Toronto Region and Urban Employment Council as their manager of corporate and stakeholder relations. One of the new initiatives that we've just recently launched in the last month is called the Professional Immigrant Networks. And, you know, obviously a number of skilled immigrants are coming into the Toronto area are being able to tap into the lovely bridging programs of our, of our panelists here. But we've seen them also take it a step further, been able to sort of congregate and create their own professional immigrant network. So we've done an environmental scan over the last year. We've seen some 60 to 70 different professional immigrant networks being developed here in the Toronto area. And so what exactly is that? We've seen you know groups of skilled immigrants you know organize themselves by ethnicity, by profession, by geography, or a mixture of all those three things to create a professional immigrant network. And these networks essentially are organizations that can be anything from the Canadian Columbian Professionals Association to the Iraqi Engineers and Architects Association of Toronto. So these groups, there, there are a number of them. There's some six to seven of these different professional immigrant network groups here in the Toronto area, and we're you know working through the community agencies, the bridging programs, our goal is to be able to get these different pins in front of employers. Um, I'm an international engineer of more than 30 years of experience abroad. I come to this country, great country, land of opportunity. The challenges I face, we start from scratch. First of all, language assessment. Second, lengthy process of certification. Professional engineers uh, on tape, PEO. Lack of Canadian experience. Assessment of foreign qualifications. There are programs, work placement programs, but maybe not enough, and maybe not, not so adequate. Now, the issue here is that, are there any, is there a specific strategy to improve the whole process in order to facilitate the integration of international engineers into this province of Ontario. Thank you. Uh, that strategy is sitting in the front row, and it's Jean Augustine. Uh, because she does review uh, the registration practices of all the regulatory, all the regulated professions uh, in Ontario. And uh, believe me, a lot of people have been sweating over the last few years since she came around. And, and it's, it, it's forced uh, people to kind of uh, really examine their processes and say, you know, are we doing the best that we can? 
So um, I think uh, we've got a very good strategy in place. And my experience and having worked with Skills for Change is having those international engineers do projects. I used energy pathways where under six months they were paid by, you know, UI. Instead of always just looking for jobs, working while looking. And whether it's mentoring, whether it's project based, and that networking of, you know, my Bulgarian friend and the Romanian friend and Chinese friends. And the multicultural thing is the network that gets to the flexibility with regard to Humber. We're doing sustainable energy now. We're doing things that many of those foreign countries are way ahead of North America in. So those skills have to be expressed. But it's by mentoring and by um, taking on a project to be involved. And I'd like to help those that, that, that are interested in doing that. So, I mean, the comment's a very good one. So obviously being able to have, you know, ITs have practical programs, pro complete practical projects while they're going through the bridging program so they can use that experience to be able to meet others within the engineering industry and being able to leverage that for employment opportunities post this bridging program then. By working, the two people that worked for me, they became P engines. Right. But they were if they were just going to sit and study and worry right. about passing that exam, but by doing projects in a field related, in our case energy management. Mm -hmm. So you may be a mechanical or a civil engineer, we're not asking you to do engineering, but you do a project and by working on those things, you're Networking, you're you're reaching out. How well do you leverage those students who've gone through your program, you know, successfully, and have then been able to find gainfully and find employment? How well do you go back to leverage them and having them come back as guest speakers, being able to tap into the organizations that they work with? What do you, in a sense, for maybe one or two of you, in terms of what you do to be able to leverage the alumni, as you mentioned? Yes, Denny. Um, I, I am proud to say that some of our alumni actually have come back and have become teachers in our bridging programs, and we have found that when you have somebody who, who, says, who, who is teaching and who has said, here are the struggles I faced and here I am today, um, it really uh, elevates the confidence of the students who are in, the, in, in that classroom. So that's one of the, uh, the, the, the way that we use uh, the alumni. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and we also invite uh, our alumni to, to be guest speakers mm -hmm. for, for our engineering connections groups. And we also partner with our, like, uh, uh, partners, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we have a uh, joint networking event, so we can expand. Uh, okay. So we invite uh, graduates of the program and uh, current participants in the program. So we do that. So we expand the networking and uh, the okay. chances. So networking and opportunities and having the more yeah. like like in participants, yes, because Chris, yeah. yes, uh, we have an alum alumni association as well because we find that people who have become successful really want to help. They really want to mm -hmm. give back. And they're really enthusiastic. So yes, they do um, come back to to be guest lecturers and, and uh, uh, TA in certain you know uh, labs and so on. But uh, they love to mentor the people that are going through and share their experience. Regarding assessment of foreign credentials in engineering, uh, when I came here, I didn't know that there are different bodies exist like WBS and ICAS and even the PEO and all that. So uh, I kept on uh, like uh, getting my credential assessment from different bodies. But when I thought of uh, applying for higher education, doctorate or PhD in engineering, the Canadian university said that you have to get uh, like your own transcripts from your home country. Uh, like if I did, uh, like my, my education is diploma in engineering, Bachelor's in Engineering, Master's in Engineering, MBA. But I had to get transcripts from all the uh, home uh, institutions, four institutions, and the letter of recommendations from uh, uh, back home. And if I apply to five Canadian universities, then I have to get all these transcripts to be sent to different uh, universities. And I also got a WS assessment, I also got ICAS assessment, uh, Professional Engineers Ontario assessment and the another process of getting a provision license, uh, almost done. So uh, the problem is, if you want to improve your education, you have to get your assessment again and again from parallel bodies. And, and, and uh, I've heard this over and over in my own field, that um, I applied to university, I needed uh, original transcripts. I, I go to the licensing um, 
apply for the national licensing exam, I have to uh, supply original transcripts. So I think that a, a common database, as you're, as you're yeah. saying, that it's one person or one organization has looked at the credentials, has verified that they are uh, real, that should, uh, that should do the job, especially in this age of technology. I applaud you for attending today's session. I applaud Skills for Change for hosting uh, this a very important session on, on engineering, especially as we commemorate and come to an end and close out March uh, Engineering Month. So thank you all for being here. And also thank you very much to our panelists, Chris, Rashid, Denis, Gabriella. Please give them all a round of applause. Thank you very much.